is God an add-on to my life that I use for my purposes, or is he the centerpiece of my life and I'm available to be used for his purposes? Hello, friends, and welcome. I thought I'd start this episode with a quote from Dallas Willard. This comes from the book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. He writes, Little good results from insisting that Christ is also supposed to be Lord. To present his lordship as an option leaves it squarely in the category of white wall tires and stereo equipment for the new car. You can do without it. And it is, alas, far from clear what you would do with it. Obedience and training in obedience form no intelligible doctrinal or practical unity with the salvation presented in recent versions of the gospel. A little bit later he goes on, Non-discipleship costs abiding peace, a life penetrated throughout by love, faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good, hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances, power to do what is right and withstand the forces of evil. In short, it costs exactly that abundance of life that Jesus said he came to bring. He continues, The correct perspective is to see following Christ not only as the necessity it is, but as the fulfillment of the highest human possibilities and as life on the highest plane. Perhaps another way of phrasing what Willard is saying here is that, is God an add-on to my life that I use for my purposes, or is he the centerpiece of my life and I'm available to be used for his purposes? So am I using God to get him to do what I want him to do, or am I allowing God to use me to do what he wants me to do? And of course, from a human perspective, one person using another person to get them to do what they want, that manipulation either way is bad. But when we come to talk about our relationship with God, us using God to do what we want him to do versus God using us to do what he wants us to do, those things are not comparable because God is all loving and all wise. So everything that he wants us to do is both good for us and good for everyone around us versus when we want him to do what we want him to do, generally, uh, even if our motive is really good, we are not wise enough to know what is the best thing, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. So then, rather than using God as Willard talks about, kind of like optional equipment. Uh, He mentioned white wall tires and radio equipment uh, kind of dating (laughs) when that was written probably. But rather than kind of optional equipment to go along with our lives, sort of an add-on, the greatest joy in life is to be found in making God the centerpiece of our life and, and making him our life. And to learn to walk in union with God as we were created to. So Adam and Eve were made to be connected to God in such an intimate, close way that they wouldn't even know what good and evil was apart from him. So they wouldn't even know what was right and what was wrong apart from the direction of God. They were going to be dependent on him to for everything, to know what was good and what was bad. Uh, sadly, they chose independence and chose to make that choice on their own. And now we have inherited from them this sinful nature that seeks to determine good and evil apart from God. And when mankind seeks to determine what is good and what is evil apart from God, independent from God, we inevitably get it wrong, and we end up calling good things evil and evil things good. And so Paul exhorts us in Ephesians that our thinking should no longer be like the Gentiles, In Ephesians 4, 17, he says, Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So the beauty of life in Christ is being reconciled back to God, being joined back to God. In 1 Corinthians six seventeen, it says, whoever is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. So we're reconciled to God, we're connected with God, we're joined with God, 
and now we can live out our life in communion with Him as we were created to. God is not an extra in our life to be used the way that we might think of pagans actually using their God when they need a favor or when they need something to to go their way that's beyond their capacity. They, you know, offer a prayer or offer a sacrifice to this God to get him to do what they want. (laughs) That's not the way our relationship with God is supposed to work. On the contrary, we're supposed to be moved at all times by the Spirit of God, that we walk in Christ, as Colossians chapter 2 says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So every moment of our day is connected with Christ. It says that our life is hidden in Christ. Colossians 3 3 says, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So we have been joined with Jesus. We have been made royal sons. Our citizenship is in heaven. We've been made co-heirs with Christ. We get to inherit everything that Jesus inherits, and we get to administrate his kingdom with him. We get to co-labor with Christ to administrate the government and the rule of God on the earth. And this is our greatest honor and greatest joy. And regardless of where we find ourselves geographically or vocationally, it doesn't matter if you're a shoe salesman in a mall in America or if you're a farmer in rural Indonesia, you can still experience the rule and reign of Christ regardless of your position in life, regardless of your location on planet Earth. The joy of Christ's government, the joy of Christ reigning over us is what Jesus came to bring near to us, that the kingdom of God is near is the good news that Christ preached in Mark chapter 1, which is a big difference between the gospel of just going to heaven when you die, that someday uh, after you leave this earth, then your relationship with Christ will be really important. But for now, you have to kind of do life on your own or, you know, uh, you still need to go about your day and just make sure that you have this fire insurance policy, make sure you get your eternal visa so that you don't go to hell when you die. That's a true misunderstanding of the gospel. And the point of this podcast is not to make us feel guilty for all the moments of our day where God is not the center or when we're kind of going about our lives independent from God. My, my point is not to make us feel guilty, but to remind us of the great joy that we forfeit when we don't make Christ the center of our lives. The Bible says that it's God's goodness that leads us to repentance, so we don't need to to, to feel guilty and think that our guilt is going to drive us to make Jesus king. What's going to ultimately motivate us to make Jesus king is when we see how good he is and how wonderful it is when he rules over us. I think it's pretty easy to make anyone feel guilty for not obeying Jesus because we all still have areas of our life where we're not completely submitted to God. But guilt is a cruel master and it's a poor motivator. And I think what God would rather us respond to is his goodness and us saying, oh, not that I feel guilty and I really owe God, so I'm going to do this. Um, that kind of makes us the hero in the story. Like, okay, because I'm a good, devoted person, I'm going to give my life to God. Rather than saying, oh, God is so awesome, I'd be a fool not to let him rule every moment of my day. That makes Jesus, the hero of the story, because he's so good, of course, why wouldn't we follow him? And so that's my exhortation, is that we would all make Jesus the hero of our story, and in doing so, we would learn to live more and more of our minutes each day yielded to him under the leading and guiding of his Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 3.16, Paul is writing out his prayer for the Ephesians, and he's saying, I'm praying that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, or in the King James, he says, in your inner man. Which means that if Paul was praying for the inner man or the inner being of these believers to be strengthened, it means that there can be different kind of levels of strength in our inner man. If we can get stronger, it means we can also be weaker. And so we should seek to be strengthening our inner man. That's what Paul talks about when he says that we're transformed from one degree of glory to another. In uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, 
And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So it says we're all being transformed into the same image. That image is the image of Christ, that we're all maturing into Christ. When we get born again, we get born into the family of God. And when you're born, who you're born to determines so much about your life. You know, it determines frequently your position in life, the opportunities that you will have. Um, but you also are born into a physical, fleshly family. And the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, how tall you'll be, how big you will be, you know, your intelligence, your personality, all of these things are inherited from that physical DNA that we receive from our parents and from our ancestors. And so when we get born of the Spirit, we are born with the spiritual DNA that is after the pattern of Christ. So we grow up into Christ, just like an apple seed has the pattern of an apple tree in that seed. When you plant it in the ground and when you take care of it, it cannot grow up and become an orange tree or a pear tree. It can only grow up to become the apple tree that's written on the inside of that seed that after the you know the dna that's on the inside of that seed in the same way jesus compares you know the word of god is a seed in mark chapter 4 he tells these four different parables where he talks about the word of god is a seed he says to them this is mark 4 13 he says do you not understand this parable how then will you understand all the parables so he tells these this key parable of the seed and the sower and he's talking about the seed is the word of God. In Mark 14, he says, the sower sows the word of God. So this word of God comes to us, and when it is uh, guarded and protected, when it's understood and it's hidden in our hearts, it produces this fruit and it grows up so that we all grow up after the model, after the pattern of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's talking about God has given the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the purpose of equipping the saints, that's all the other believers in the church, for the work of ministry. Now that's really interesting because it's not the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers who are doing the work of the ministry. They're equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. It says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And so this deposit that God has placed on the inside of us, the Holy Spirit, is growing us up and it's maturing us until we become like Christ. And how did Christ walk on the earth? Well, John in John chapter 4, Christ says, I only do what I see my Father doing. So Christ walked in unity with the Father, only doing the things that he saw the Father doing. In John 6, 38, Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so, likewise, as we grow up into Christ more and more, that should be our attitude. I'm not on this earth to do my will. I'm on the earth to do the will of the Father. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you, Christ said to his disciples. So, just like Jesus did not come to do the will, his own will, but the will of the Father, uh, likewise, we don't do our own will, but we seek to do the will of Christ. And the more we pursue that, the more we find true life. Just like Jesus said, you know, whoever would lose his life will find it. The more we're willing to give up our own fleshly life and our own desires to seek the desires of God, we give up our will to seek his will. We give up experiencing what we want to experience what he wants. We find that, wow, that's really where life is. Life is in knowing God and being with him and doing the things he wants with him. And that's different from uh, our best guess of what he thinks we want to do, and we go out and we try to do something for him. Uh, this is birthed out of an intimacy. The works of Jesus 
were birthed out of a nearness to God before Christ even started his ministry when he was baptized. You know, the heavens were open, the Holy Spirit descended, and God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So Christ's service of God was born out of knowing that God was already pleased with him. It was not an effort to try and earn God's favor or to get God to be pleased with him. And likewise, our service of the Lord should not be born out of a place of trying to get God's attention or earn God's approval or get his favor, but it's born out of a place of intimacy, of already knowing we've been made blameless by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that we are already above reproach, that God is never going to count our sin against us, and he has already brought us as close as we can be brought. He has made himself, he has joined himself to us. And so our life of obedience is just a response of love and joy and enjoying the nearness that Jesus has already provided for us. And so as we mature as sons in God's kingdom, we understand that God has made the kingdom available to us, not so that we can build our own little kingdom, but so that we can build his kingdom. The resources that God gives us are not to be used to build our own kingdom, even as a son and a royal family on the earth. If he takes the royal family's resources and just spends them on his own extravagant lifestyle, um, he's considered a, a bad king. But the king that takes the royal resources and uses them to serve the people is a beloved king, is a good king. Jesus says that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who is servant of all. And so God has entrusted us to be co-heirs with Christ, and we're to steward what he has entrusted us with to see his kingdom established on the earth that all peoples would know the goodness of God. Thank you for listening. God bless you.